in the Zaf Ages. I hope to finish Asset Apostles, Great Controversy, and the rest of the Christian before the year is through. But I find the Bible come alive when I read it through that way. If you think it can benefit, it's there, just ask for the guidance. Another guide is there, unrelated to read different and why. And that is reading the Bible through chronologically. In the sequence in which the events in the Bible happen, not in the sequence that are recorded in the present Bible. You can buy the Bible arranged chronologically. It's expensive. I saw someone in the process of here for 27 pounds something pence. You can get a reading guide. It's free. And use your present Bible. No problem. Choice is yours. But I find that you can make good sense of some of the Psalms. And some of the minor prophets. Until you read the Bible chronologically. When you read some of the imprecatory Psalms, when David called up cursing on his enemies, it's hard to understand how one who followed God as a friend of God can pray those kind of prayer until you read the incidents in the Chronicles and Kings that gave rise to those prayers. And I say, aha, now I understand. Are you with me? So the six reading guys will be out there. Have a look at them. Don't take them away. Let us turn to the word of God. I'm reading through, as I told you, the Bible, but I'm preaching through Matthew. And you have think about two from me on Matthew already. I want to speak to us from Matthew 4, 12 to 22. Follow me, an invitation to service. Let's pray. Father, guide our thinking, aid our learning, bring us to good practice, for Christ's sake. Amen. 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 Now in Matthew chapter 3, to Matthew 4, verse 1 to 11, Jesus is identified and baptized by John the Baptist. John said elsewhere in the Gospel of John, I wouldn't have known. I said, the Holy Spirit tell me that the one who is in the Spirit descend and rest on him, abide on him. That's the one. And I bear witness that this is the Son of God. In that same section of the Bible, Jesus is acknowledged by God, the Father, as his Son. On a voice in heaven saying after his baptism, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. In that same section, Jesus is invested with and tested by the Holy Spirit. He came out of the water, he was praying, and as he was praying, what happened? The Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, alighted on him. In the same, same section, Christ, after his baptism, went out into the desert and prayed for 40 days. He fasted. Now while he was fasting, he was on God's ground. It was the Spirit who led him there to be tested, to prove himself. But the devil turned up and the devil used the same happenings to tempt him. To tempt him. 
But Christ demonstrated that there's a strategy for dealing with the devil's temptation. And in those three temptations, there are three vital lessons. Number one, maintain implicit trust in the Word of God. When tempted, Christ said, it is written. And when you have a quote in the Bible to try to share, you see, I'm quoting Bible too. It's okay. Christ said, I have. But you got to take the Bible as a whole. Don't just sing out one portion that suits your fancy. So when I take the Bible as a whole, I learned that what you ask me to do is wrong. Maintain implicit trust in God's word. Resist the temptation to act presumptuously. If God asks you to do something and danger arises, God can protect you. But when you do what you like and put yourself in the way of danger, don't ask God to act contrary to his purposes. If you are across the road as a blind person, and you didn't know if it was coming, God can protect you. But don't go out there, blind for yourself and say, see, I'm going to prove to you that God is good. And walk across the road deliberately, blind before you. You're getting for trouble. Am I making sense here? Don't tempt God to act presumptuously. You wouldn't. Resist the temptation to act presumptuously. And also, accept that there is no shortcut to anywhere worth going. You can walk more efficiently, you can walk more effectively, but you got to stay the course. There is no shortcut to anywhere worth going. The devil said to Christ, you ain't got to go to the cross, you ain't got to do all them stuff, you ain't got to spit in your face, pull your hair, do that kind of stuff. Bow down and worship me, I'll give it all to you. Don't take shortcuts, it's not worth it. But in our passage that we're dealing with today, Jesus received news that John the Baptist is in prison. John the Baptist had dared to tell off Herod for marrying his brother's wife. He didn't like it, Herod. She didn't like it, Herodias. And so they had John put in prison. But Herod was afraid of John. And sought to protect him, but Herodias, she wanted to get rid of him. How dare he point this finger in my face? And she was trying to find a way to get rid of him. Herod wanted to listen to John, but he feared him. But she found a way. Salome danced for Herod at his birthday bash. He liked what he saw, offered her anything she wanted to go his kingdom. She comes home to the mom, mom said, ask for help John the Baptist. And in the end, she took John the Baptist's head on a platter and gave it to her mother. What a thing to ask a young child to do. In that same passage, Christ returns from, to Galilee. He returns to Galilee. One day he leaves Nazareth to set in Capernaum. Thus fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 9, 1, 10. His name is in Manchester, but it is Willingshaw to settle in God. Are you understanding? Galilee is a bigger district, and Capernaum and Nazareth were areas within Galilee. In that same passage, Christ 
begins his public ministry by preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, or for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Who before him preached that? John the Baptist. Different preachers say the truth because the gospel is everlasting. It doesn't change. Repent. Change your mind. Change your attitude. Because the kingdom of heaven is near. In that same passage, Christ begins public ministry by inviting, by calling his first followers. He begins his public ministry by calling his first followers. He was in Galilee. If you look in the back of your Bibles, you might find that if a map there, I can give you the geography, the geog geographical layout of all these places that we're talking about. He's in Galilee, northern portion of Palestine. Galilee is historically divided into Upper Galilee, Lower Galilee. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia it is better divided into the coastal plain, Upper Galilee, Lower Galilee, the plain of Israel, and the adjacent portions of the Rift Valley, that is the Jordan River system. It helps us to get a better picture in our mind as we look at the map of the layout of Galilee. And it's here that Christ begins his ministry. In Galilee, Christ spent his boyhood and his ministry took place in Nazareth to Galilee. It's interesting. These were not places much thought about. When it was told that the former Messiah, somebody asked, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Christ proved that good news can come out of Nazareth. Later on, when you are looking at um, getting rid of Jesus, and Nicodemus spoke up in the council, saying, does our law allow us to condemn somebody to have first given them a hearing? The high priest said, hey, are you from Galilee too? Don't you know, no prophet ever come from Galilee? I'm saying that to this, these were not regions much taught of. They were an esteemed area. If anybody didn't come from those places. But Jesus grew up there, and he began his ministry there in Galilee of the Gentile. And you know how the Jews felt about Gentile. Galilee. Much of the rest of Christ's ministry took place in the northern end of Galilee. And in the area like Capone and so forth, he was 80 to 90 miles away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not his territory of ministry, except he went up there for the annual feasts. His area, his territory, was mainly Galilee. The Sea of Galilee, where Christ made his first call, his first followers, is about, well, the other dimensions given there. So many kilometers long or miles wide. That's, that's the Sea of Galilee. It's on those shores that Christ calls for us followers. 
Now, the Sea of Galilee is so named because of the district in which it's located. If you are saying the Sea of Manchester, it's named the Sea of Galilee. It is also called by another name because of the northwestern shore where the waters of Genesaret poured down. So it is also known as the Lake of Genesaret. When the quote by some other names in the Old Testament, it's called the Sea of Tiberias because Tiberias is a palace in that area. It's also called Chenereth or Chenereth in the Old Testament. It goes by many names, Sea of Galilee. Now I want to observe from our scripture reading three things about the call, the invitation that Christ gives. First of all, observe the invitation is personal. The invitation is personal. Jesus called Peter and Andrew. They were in their boat, and there must be other boats around. Did they say, hey, you, come here? He called Peter and Andrew. The call was personal. As he went further, he saw James and John in the boat with their father Zebedee. He didn't call Zebedee. He called Peter, sorry, called James and John. It was personal. Those were the people he wanted. This is not unusual. Later on, you will read where as he was walking, and came in the seat of custom, he saw Matthew, also called Levi, at the seat of custom, and he said to him, follow me. He didn't call others around Matthew, he called specifically what he wanted. It was personal. Here are some examples. Abraham and his family left and settled. They left off the car, they settled here, and then God said to him, to Abraham, leave your people and go to a land I will show you. He didn't ask him to bring the others. He spoke to Abraham. It was personal. Moses, God appeared to him in a burning bush. Take off your shoes to this holy ground. I have seen the affliction of my people, I have heard their cry, I have come down to deliver. Now I am sending you. I am sending you. It was personal. Moses tried to get out of it, but God said, Look, I am going to send the Aaron to help you. But you are the one responsible. I'm going to speak to you, he'll be your mouthpiece, he'll be your megaphone, he will be your amplifier. But I'm sending you, you're the leader. And there was Joshua. God said to Moses, God said to Joshua, my son of Moses is dead. Now I cannot lead the people across. There were others there. There were Caleb and others, but God didn't call them. It was personal. He called Joshua. Because it was Joshua who wanted. There's Samuel. Samuel couldn't recognize God's voice, but God called him. Samuel went to Eli. They said, they call him, back and lie down. God called again, he went back to Eli. Go back and lie down. God called again. He said, Look, oh, if you hear the voice again, say, Speak, Lord, your servant here. God wanted Samuel. And he called Samuel. He didn't call Eli. 
And if those people can recognize his voice, God still call because there's someone who can teach him how to recognize God's voice. God calls those who want and he calls personal. God calls Saul. Saul was busy persecuting the, the church. God calls Saul, Saul. Who is it, Lord? Why are you persecuting us not me? And Jesus took me persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the bricks. And Saul later on testified that he called us apostles. And Saul did say to the king, so I was not disobedient to the heavenly voice. He called us personal. And then in the book of Acts, when they wanted some food managers, and the early church through Peter said to the people, go, choose seven men. They chose seven, they didn't call everybody. They found seven people, the names are given there in the book of Acts. One of them was Stephen, one was Nicada. They were called and they were, they had hands put on them to do the service that they were called for. I'm saying to the call as a person. And you can find all instances in the Bible where God's call to individuals like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Elijah was personal. From one individual to another, but also observe that the call was particular, very definite. It was appropriate to the individual's skill set. Not everybody could do what Moses did. And when those seven food managers were sought, Peter told them what qualities to look for. Men full of faith, full of wisdom, full of spirit, and they chose people who had given proof of their capacity to serve. The call was particular. It was appropriate to the skill set of the people called. God had picked people suited to the purpose he had in mind for them. It was suited to the individual's natural and cultivated abilities. Moses had already demonstrated that he was going to be a leader. And by his training in the household of Pharaoh, he knew how to interact with royalty. The call was suited to his natural and cultivated abilities. So it was to the others whom God called. Joshua was apprenticed to Moses and he learned under Moses, when right? Moses died, he was ready. The call is particular, it is consistent with individual's giftedness. Spiritual gifts were given to make sure that they fit the task that God had in mind for them. And even when they were building the sanctuary, and God wanted two artisans to make sure that the curtains and decorations were just right, God skilled two workmen and gave them to Moses as men who were able to do exactly what God wanted. The call was consistent with the individual's giftedness. Follow me, and I'll make you, poor fishermen, to be fishers of men. You are accustomed to this already, catching things. Just transform your skill out to catching people. There's something that's about the call. Something that's about the invitation. It was personal. 
It was particular, it was purposeful. They wasn't called just to sit down and do nothing. They were called to serve. They were called to be laborers together with God. They were called because God had a mission in mind for them. There was a goal, there was an end, there was an objective. Mission. Guiding the mission to which you call them. He had in mind exactly what he wanted to accomplish. He wanted to take Israel, children of Israel, from Egyptian bondage to a land to the Lake and Honey. He told Moses, Go now, I'm sending you. He wanted to catch men for his kingdom. So he called Peter and Andrew, James and John. He wanted to manage food distribution better. So he chose seven deacons. He wanted to lead the children of Israel from this side of the river over into the promised land. So he chose Joshua. There was a specific goal, a definite target, something that God wanted to achieve. And he called specific people with a purpose in mind. Are you with me, brethren? A clear vision of the mission, a definite work towards a specific goal, a specific objective, a specific end. Also, we observe that the call implied a development by God of qualities that they are going to have. Somebody said God doesn't necessarily call him qualified. He qualifies those who we call. When Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? God said, what's in your hand? Start the truth on the ground. It became a snake. But he said, I'm going to qualify you. I'll give you power to work miracles. Pharaoh will not believe you. Go, I'm sending you. God qualifies those who be called. The only, the only apostles, they were told to wait in Jerusalem until power has come upon you. Then you will be witnesses unto me in Judea and Samaria and the others part of the earth. And they waited and the Holy Spirit descended in tongues of prayer with the Pentecost. God qualifies those who we call. He didn't call Peter, he didn't call Andrew, he didn't call James and John and Levi, Thaddeus, Bartholomew, 12 of them. He called and picked from among his disciples. And he breathed on them, we are told, and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And he sent them out, the twelve, before they sent out seventy. He qualifies those who are. Just spent three years with him. Three and a half years. That's about the kind of spread with the university degree these days. So when we tell you God to be educated to serve God, they gotta think again. Christ spent three and a half years educating these people, making sure they were fit for the work he had in mind for them to do. Are you in the brethren? Mm -hmm. And God can qualify you. God can qualify you for the work he has in mind for you to do. The call implies development. Follow me and I will make you. I'll develop you into. I'll change what you are now to what I want you to be. I will make you fishes of men. You are not yet fishes of men, but I will make you fishes of men. The call implies development. The invitation was personal. 
It was particular. It was purposeful. There was a person called Peter Andrew to be made the fish of men so that he could bring men to Christ. Same for James and John. Same for Matthew. God had in mind the establishment of people who be his light to the whole world. And Abraham was the start of that. To Abraham, the whole world was to be blessed. God called Abraham because he had a particular task for him to do, he had a purpose for him to accomplish. The same it was for Moses, the definite task to lead God's people into the promised land of the milk and honey. It was the same for Joshua, a definite task with a specific purpose, lead these people into the promised land and settle them there. The same to Samuel. I've been trying to reach Eli. I can't get to him. I want you to go and talk to Eli and let him know that judgment is coming. A definite task with a specific goal in mind. The same for Saul. When God sent him to his spokesman, we are told that Saul was told, I want you to be a light to the Gentiles, to take my message to the end of the earth. And he saw it. Oh yes, he did. Peter preached more to those who were of the circumcision, those who were Jews. Paul preached more to those who were not the circumcision, those who are Gentiles. A specific work. I want to beat Paul here, he went over there. I want to whip him there, he went over there. I want to try to kill him there, he went over there. Because his call was to go among the Gentiles and proclaim Jesus Christ. And he was not disobedient to the call. And so it was for the early church, he was some food managers. And because for the day they work, we told the word of God prosper. The word of God prosper, and many priests became obedient to the truth. Because the apostles were free from managing food to preach in the world. And before the next to pray. So the definite goal, the definite purpose to achieve, the definite end. And God is still calling for a group. Read up for this. Jesus the call is personal. God is calling you. The call is particular. He has a definite mission in mind. The call is purposeful. God wants you to make saviors. For men and women. Bring this one for the place, the Lord.
can talk to me. What of you think of it? Which of you think God is talking to you? Personally. Because it's a particular work for you to do. Because he has a man of purpose he wants to achieve. <coughs> Will you speak please? You call. 
We have heard your call in our heart to respond with joy. And we kneel pledge you our allegiance. We kneel as past and ever acknowledging your call to these ladies. Acknowledging their response and their willingness to continue serving you in the capacity of taking us within Manchester Southern Church. We ask the Holy Spirit's blessing upon them, His presence with them. We ask that He will guide and direct and that He will facilitate their best service. We ask as a congregation acknowledging that we have called and have responded to the work together with them cooperate with them, to do not just our wish and purpose, but to do your will, your desire, so the goal, the objective, the purposes seek to achieve will be achieved as they take their particular duties. Father, I pray that we be not only with them, but all the other all the others in this church who have heard your voice to them personally, who have accepted to serve in particular areas, grant that as they give themselves to you, they'll be developed, they'll be aided, and they'll be facilitated to accomplish your will in areas which you are silent, so that your work is well done. Your goals are achieved, your people are blessed. Be with us as we contemplate your call. We are in this church to do your bidding. Bless us, we pray, by filling us with your spirit and by guiding us in the path that you have us go. May your will always be done. May your purpose always be served, and the improvement satisfaction in serving you as they serve others. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the first of the Holy Spirit be your spawn, now and forevermore. Amen.